Hey everybody, thank you so much for checking out this sermon online today. This is a sermon and a message that we believe in, and God is doing great things right here in Wenatchee, Washington. If you are someone who has been compelled by this, we would ask for you to pray and consider giving financially to this ministry so that we can keep everything rocking and rolling and doing great. You are a part of this church. Our online community is just the same as our regular community. So we have pastors available for you. We've got a way to reach out and talk with you and pray with you. And we would love to do those things. One of the things that makes that possible is your financial contribution. The link is in the description below. Just click on it and it'll guide you through the easy process to give to Awaken Church. We are so thankful for you and we pray that you're blessed this week. Have a great day. God bless. Bam. It's almost here, guys. It's almost here. Thank you guys for coming this morning. Anybody have a wild uh, snow experience? Uh, it, it was wild last night. It was dumping snow, and we still had a ton of people. It's awesome. But I'm thankful for you guys to be here. Anybody in here love hot chocolate? Like, good old, give me a mocha, like an adult hot chocolate is a mocha. <laughs> I love a triple grande white mocha. Uh, but... But, but, but hot chocolate, there's nothing like a hot chocolate with tons of whipping cream and marshmallows and toppings. So here's the deal. At the end of this message, we're going to have hot chocolate out there with all of the fixings. And you can have as much whipped cream as you want or as much as your wife will allow you to have or your husband. We got more whipped cream than we can handle. And, and, and I want you to remember today hot chocolate and Abigail. Turn to someone and say hot chocolate. Abigail. Abigail's hot chocolate. But right now, before we begin, would you pull the paper out from under your seat? Just grab that out. And I got, a, I got you uh, something that I need God's help. God, would you help us reveal these people, these things in our life right now in Jesus' name? Um, I want you to write down every person or every situation this week that you had to deal with that you felt was wrong, or you were wronged, um, or, or, or somebody that was evil towards you, or, or something someone said they did. I want you to write down just in the last month, who, who, who is, what, what's taking place? Now, if your husband or wife sitting next to you, you might want to write it really small. It's okay. Um, but I, I just want you to take a moment, please, just write it out. Who, what was it? Someone cut you off when they were driving. Someone in the grocery store. Um, um, somebody on the internet. I don't know. This is, this is the golden rule. The golden rule is, is do unto others what you would have others do unto you. And that's so simple. That's what Jesus said. Do unto others what you would want them to do to you. But, but the problem is it's good until someone mistreats me. I love this rule until someone mistreats me and I go, now it's my turn to treat you. <laughs> and, and then we change it to do unto others like it has been done to you. And it feels natural to return the favor of, 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 of evil for evil. It feels so natural. And the worst, I think, in our culture is so many adults, when they were children, they went through something that they still haven't grown out of. Their dad mistreated them, their mom mistreated them, their boss, their teacher, and they grow up. And as funny as it may sound, the person that mistreated them when they were younger, they, they can't go back and deal with them. So they mistreat you and they mistreat their kids and they mistreat their wife because it's their way of getting even with somebody that isn't even in their life. And they take it out on us or we take it out on others because we're powerless about a situation. And so we compensate. And the problem with getting even with somebody, you know, when you really get even is that you're even with them. Who wants to be even with someone you don't even like? Anybody in the room? You don't like them. Why are you getting even with them? Let's not be even with the people that we don't like. Let's be above them. Let, let's be in the, in the positive with them. This is a hot chocolate story that I want to read to you today. It's almost Christmas. So, so I, I love this story. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And 
I want to pray because I think God's going to speak to you through this story. And I think different things are going to come up that you're going to go, oh man, I know exactly how to deal with this. But Father, I lift you up in this room. I thank you for the babies, these, these children that are going to grow up and be after your own heart. I thank you for this church. It's so much bigger than what we see now. And God, I just ask that you would do something new. I pray for a $300 million, million dollar miracle. <laughs> 300 would be, 1,000 would be nice. But God, just, I pray for a miracle and I thank you that you love the Huskies enough to put them in the national championship soon to be. In Jesus, we just speak that as prophecy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, this story is about David and David is a fugitive and he's running from a king. The king is the guy that stood there and didn't know what to do with Goliath and little David came with his cheese and his wine for his brothers and he's like, hey, why don't, why don't you guys do something? And then David said, I'll do something about it. So he went out and he killed Goliath with the stone. He, he, he flung it, hit him in the head, killed him. And, and he's a hero, but then the king got jealous of David. And so the king ended up chasing David. And in the process of chasing David, David could have killed the king, but God didn't, but, but David saw that the king was anointed by God. He, did, he would, didn't want to kill him or do anything apart from God. And so he did the right thing. So David is this guy that has a heart after God. He's doing the right stuff. He's a hero. He's being hunted by a guy that's jealous of him. And this is where the story starts. And there's going to be a lot of scripture in here. So let's start here. If you have your Bible, you can open up to 1 Samuel 25. And we're starting in verse 2. Verse 2, 1 Samuel 25, 2. It says this. There was a wealthy man from Maon who owned property near the town of Carmel, which sounds tasty. And he had 300 sheep and 1,000 goats, and it was sheep shearing time, and this man's name was Nabal. And his wife, Abigail, okay, everybody say, Abigail. Abigail. Oh, Abigail. She was sensible and a beautiful woman. She's a double threat. She's pretty and she's smart. But Nabal, he's a, he's a monster. He's a descendant of Caleb and was crude and mean in all of his dealings. <laughs> I like the, the name Nabal means foolish. And, and we know he's a rich man that has money and he's foolish. And Abigail is beautiful and smart. So here's two key characters. It says, when David heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep, he sent 10 of his young men to Carmel with this message from Nabal. Peace and prosperity to your family and everything you own. I'm told that it is sheep shearing time. While your shepherds stayed among us near Carmel, we never harmed them and nothing was ever stolen from them. Ask your own men and they will tell you this is true. So, so would you be kind to us since we have come at a time of celebration? Please share any provisions you might, you might have on hand with us and with your friend David. David's young men gave this message to Nabal in David's name and they waited for a reply. Now this sounds, this sounds pretty nice. David's out in the field. He has four, uh, he has uh, 600 men. They're all a bunch of warriors. They could easily just take the sheep, take the guy's property. But this is the problem with being a believer in God, right? We don't do those things. That's not who we are. And that's not who David is. So instead of taking, David protects the sheep of this guy. And in a moment of need, David says, hey, hey, I know that you're in a moment where you get blessing. Could you help us out? We didn't hurt you. We just would love some favor. I think of people that, that we could have done something, but we didn't, right? Who's, who's in your life where you could have responded, but you didn't? You could have stepped out and done something, but you didn't. I, I like this video. I want you to check out this video. This guy, this is a classic situation in a lot of our lives, right? This guy, oh. Oh, look at you. Look at you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and now he's even more angry. Uh, and this is, this is kind of the moments in our life where 
where you run into these situations where someone does evil. And, and in the process of evil, we, res- we respond. We have a way of responding. And, and, and we, re- we can react. And here's what I'd say. But God in our life stops us from reacting in a way that hurts people. But God in our life calls us to respond to people that have hurt us differently. And it goes on. It says this. Who is this fellow, David? Nabal sneered to the young men. Who does this son of Jesse think he is? There are lots of servants these days who run away from their masters. Should I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've slaughtered from my shears and give it to a band of outlaws who come from who knows where? So David, David's young men returned and told him what Nabal had said. And David said, mount up, boys. He said, get your swords, was David's reply. And he strapped on his own, and 400 men started off with David, and 200 remained behind to guard their equipment. Nabal repays good, even though it says on your fill-in-the-blanks for, it's with evil. Nabal repays good that David did with evil. And I wonder how many people in your life have tried to be good to you and you've treated them rough. Anybody had parents? And then you became a parent, you realized how, how you kind of traded good with uh, their good for your evil a little bit. And you feel bad about it and now God's blessing you with your own situation. And I love this rule of the 51%. We should never have a person in our life where we don't give more than they give to us. Our, our friends, just make it a goal. I'm just going to give 1% more than you give to me. If you make it a goal to always be above them and not even with them, it's an amazing friendship. It's a 51% rule. And, and, and David, um, David meets this, this, I did good, I traded, and you took my good and, and you paid it with evil, and so I'm going to kill you. And David gets 400 men, and they're marching. Just think about it. You can just hear it. They're like, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm, uh, let's go get them. That, this is ridiculous. They, th- we could have just taken this stuff. I love what James 1.20 says. Human anger does not produce righteousness God desires. It just doesn't. Anytime that you're responding in anger, it doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. If you're a person that struggles with anger, realize that's not the righteousness God has called. I was thinking of self-control and how, how, how you can wear your self-control out. Like when you're tired. Like when you get really tired, anybody, you have less self-control. Or the other spot is when you're hungry. I'm, my wife, when she doesn't eat, she loses her self-control a tad. And, 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 and so you can wear your, your self-control out to where you start to re- respond or react because, be, because of, a, of a rhythm problem. You got out of rhythm. You got out of the rhythm of life. You got out of, that's why I love church. When you come to church, it puts you back into a rhythm of that's right, God is first. That's right, I need to do what he wants me to do. And it goes on, it says this. Meanwhile, one of Nabal's servants went to Abigail and told her, David sent messengers from the wilderness to get, to greet our master, but he screamed insults at them. These men have been very good to us, and we, never suffer, and we never suffered any harm from them. Nothing was stolen from us, and the whole time they were with us. In fact, day and night, they were like a wall of protection to us, and the sheep, you know, uh, sorry, you need to know this and figure out what to do. For there is going to be trouble for our master and his whole family. There is so, uh, he's so ill-tempered that no one can even talk to this guy. (laughs) Abigail wasted no time. This is what I want to say. Let's step into this response that Abigail has. 
It says Abigail wasted no time. She quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two wineskins full of wine, five sheep that had been slaughtered, nearly a bushel of roasted grain, a hundred clusters of raisins, and 200 fig cakes. Anybody love fig cakes? She's got 200 of them. And she packed them on donkeys and said to her servant, go ahead, go, go on ahead. I'll follow you shortly. But she didn't tell her husband Nabal what she, had, she was doing. Here's what Abigail does. Abigail sees evil and she, she, she does good for the evil that was paid to her. She takes good and she trades it with evil. And she does it quickly. This is, this is way ahead of her time because in the Old Testament, it's an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You just treat them the way they treated you and whatever. But Abigail is treating David like, like Jesus treats us. And this is God's heart for us. It's God's heart that we don't repay evil for evil, but we, we, we give good when there's evil. 1 Samuel 25 goes on and says, as she was riding her donkey into the mountain ravine, she saw David and his men coming towards her. David had just been saying a lot of good it did to help this fellow. We protected his flocks in the wilderness, and nothing he owned was lost or stolen. But he, was repay, he repaid me evil for good. May God strike me and kill me, if even one man of his household is still alive tomorrow morning. I feel this all the time as a believer. I have these people in my life and I want to respond in a certain way, but God speaks into my heart and said, no, Daniel, this is what you have to do. And I hate it because I don't want to do it. It's not what I naturally want to do, but it's what God wants me to do. He wants me to do the right thing, but then when you do it, you will start walking around going, what good did that do me? What good did that do me? I'm not better off. I would be better off if I went to this thing. I would be better off if I just showed them how I felt. And David says to God a prayer. And this is David's prayer. God, I swear, if I don't kill all of them by tomorrow, kill me. That's quite a prayer. Anybody glad God doesn't answer every prayer we pray? And, and, and God doesn't answer this prayer. But isn't it like us that hurt people hurt people and chased people chased people and hunted people hunt people? And David turns around on what's being done to him, he starts doing to Nabal. And he tries to get even with the guy that he doesn't even like. And it goes on, it says this, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed low before him. And she fell at his feet and said, I accept all the blame in this matter. My Lord, please listen to what I have to say. I know that Nabal is a wicked and ill-tempered man. Please don't pay any attention to him. He's a fool, just as his name suggests. But I never even saw the young men you sent. I love that Abigail accepts the blame for something that her husband did. Her husband paid evil with evil, and Abigail showed up and traded good with evil. She goes on and says, Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and you, uh, and, and you yourself live, since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands, let all your enemies and those who try to harm you be a cur as cursed as Nabal is. And here is a present that I, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely remain with you uh, a lasting dynasty, for you are fighting the Lord's battles, and you have not done wrong through your entire life. Oh, man. I wish every woman would take notes from this. This is how you deal with an, a, 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 a man that's in, in, in rage. 
This is how you deal with somebody. This is how you deal with anybody in life. Ah, I'm mad. They did this, and I'm going to get even with them. And you're like, yeah, that's what fools do. They get even with fools, and now we have two fools. And then that fool, it's just never ending. And Abigail shows up and goes, hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. It's, he's, he's, he can be a ding-dong, but I'll take it. And, and by the way, David, you're a man after God's own heart. Oof. Oof. Hey, David, man, God really loves you. He has a plan for you. Hey, David, you're not fighting your battles. You're fighting God's battles. Oh, man. This is a changing moment in David's heart. I wonder how many times in a marriage do marriages trade evil for, with evil, evil with evil. Well, you said this. So it takes someone to stop and go, you're an amazing man. You don't have to make these choices. You're an amazing man. I think we all need to say this, though. You are fighting the Lord's battles. Turn to someone and say, you are fighting the Lord's battles. I want to speak this to someone in the room. Your your issue that you're going through is not just an issue. It's God's issue. It's God's battle. And this this is what my wife does to me all the time, and I hate it that it works, but it works. She goes, would you take the garbage out? I'm like barefoot, you know, in my underwear, whatever. I'm like, what? This is stupid. I hate this. This is so dumb. Whatever. You know, what? And I go to grab the garbage, and she's like, honey, your arms are ripped. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I forget about what I'm doing. I'm like, Gah, I will take the garbage out, and you just manipulated me. <laughs> honey, when you're pushing that lawnmower, oh. Woo! I'm making you a dinner tonight. I totally forgot. What was I mad about? (laughs) Abigail does something that I think we all need to do. When we trade good with evil, when we give good, it just gets your mind off of what dumb thing you were about to do. And it goes on. Even when you choose, uh, when you you are chased by those who seek to kill you, that's Saul, that's the king. Your life is safe in the care of the Lord, your God. Secure in his treasured pouch, which is his purse. That's weird. Uh, but, but the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. Ooh, that's a David and Goliath reference. Remember, remember the stone that, that flew that killed Goliath? That's how your enemies will, 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 will be taken care of. And... and When the Lord has done all that he promised and he made you a leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Did you catch that? Hey, David, when God makes you the leader of Israel, when God has his hand on you, he's guiding you. Abigail sees something in David that even a lot of people in Israel weren't seeing. She's speaking it into his life. And then your conscience won't have to bear this staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. And when the Lord has done these great things for you, remember me, your servant, Abigail. (laughs) Abigail reminds David something that we all need to be reminded. Your life is telling a story. And how you respond when people treat you bad determines what God you have in your life. And David is about ready to march in and destroy an entire family because they took his good and traded it with evil. And so now David is going to show his power and his strength. She says, remember, you're telling a story. Can I just remind every person in the room, we're not just a church. We're telling a story to this world. And the story that we're telling is that when the world sins evil, we meet them there and say, our God paid for the evil in your life. And you don't want to tell this story anymore. You don't want to live this life anymore. I love that he says you're going to kill enemies. God will kill enemies. He'll take care of your enemies. You don't worry about your enemies. Let God worry about your enemies. Am I speaking to someone in here today? You don't need to worry about the people that, that are doing all this. You need to worry about the God in you that allows you to respond in his presence. 
that David's life has been spared. We had this softball team, and I'll share this story a hundred times. And they just cranked up the music while we were playing. And I asked them to turn it down because it was way too loud, and I couldn't talk to our guy on third base. And they just turned it back up. And I just, in my heart, I wanted to hit the guy with the softball and start the team war. I can't tell you how close this was. And while I'm pitching, I'm sitting there thinking, God, I need your help. Every pitch, I need your help because I'm about ready to fight. And we're all ready to fight. And I, and I just kept feeling like God said, this isn't, how you, this, isn't, this isn't how the pastor responds. This isn't how a guy after me responds. You can't do it. And even though I felt like doing it, I couldn't do it. I, I, I can't live that way. That's not the story that I want to tell. And, and instead, it's like we have to respond with good. So at the end of it, I ran up to the guy and people thought, oh no, he's going to go fight him because it was that tent, tense. And I had a conversation with him. I said, hey, next time, if you just turn it down, I just couldn't talk to the third base. Inside, I didn't feel that way. But this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to meet evil with good. Do you really want to tell this story about how you blew up on your wife? Do you really want to tell the story about how you guys got divorced or, 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 or as a child, as a youth, how you treated your parents because they did this, so you're going to get, yeah, now you're even. No, you don't want to tell the story. It goes on and says this. David replied to Abigail, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to meet me today. I think this is powerful because when you, when, when the enemy meets you and you trade good, with evil, it destroys his plan, and you can save a family. I wonder who God sent you to this week. Thank God for your good sense. Bless you for keeping me from murdering, from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. For I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, who, kept, who has kept me from hurting you, that if you had not hurried to, out to meet me, not one of Nabal's men would still be alive tomorrow morning. Then David accepted the present and told her, return home in peace. I have heard what you said. We will not kill your husband. David, David, uh, Abigail, Abigail's good response changed David's life. And not only that, it saved her family. And I wonder, it's not just God asking us to be good, but someone needs to be saved through your actions. But I would say the opposite is true. If Abigail didn't respond the way she did, everybody would be dead, including her. I wonder, you have saved my entire family, David said. It goes on, when Abigail, Ab Abigail arrived home, she found that Nabal was throwing a big party and was celebrating like a king, and he was very drunk. So she didn't tell him anything about her meeting with David until dawn the next day. David would have marched in with a bunch of drunks partying because of all the money that they got and how stingy they were, and he would have killed every one of them, and it would have been an awful, awful part of his, his life. It goes on, it says this. In the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him what had happened. And as a result, he had a stroke and he laid paralyzed on his bed like a stone. About 10 days later, the Lord struck him and he died. Let God deal with your fools. Don't get even with fools. Let God deal with your fools. Don't, let, don't, don't, don't meet fools and be a fool. Let God deal with them and meet the fool with God's goodness in your life. 1 Peter 3.9 says this, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. Did you get that? A blessing. How do we repay people that insult us or have evil? With a blessing. How do you deal with people that, 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 that are evil with a blessing? What is God's call in our life that we don't meet and make things even? God has called us to be a blessing even to the enemy because he'll deal with the fool. 
I love it. That is what God has called you to do. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, that is what God's called you to do? That's what God, not Daniel, not Awaken, God has asked you. How do we deal with evil? We repay it with a blessing. Not that we, we, we say, hey, you're doing evil. Let's give you money for this evil. No, we meet them there with God's goodness in our life. And, and it says this, he will grant you his blessing. It may not feel like what you're doing for God is working or it's right, but God will repay you with a blessing. That's a promise. So today, why be even with people you don't like? I, I want us to make some Abigail hot chocolate. And, and these are three things to Abigail's hot chocolate. To, 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 to meet evil like Abigail, it's remember your life's telling a story, friends. Your life is telling a story. And one day you'll be sitting with your grandkids and either you'll be telling a story of what God is doing or you're going to be telling a story of what you shouldn't have done. Remember, don't, number two, don't settle for even or predictable. God has called his church to be unpredictable. When evil meets us, we are unpredictable as believers. They don't know how we're going to respond because we should respond this way, but we show up with a gift. We should respond this way, but we show up with a kind word and a reminder of who someone is. Here's the last one. Do unto others as they don't deserve. Isn't this a Christmas thing? Who do we give gifts? We give gifts to people. They don't deserve the gift we give them, some of them. They deserve coal. You know why we give a gift? Because that's who God made us to be. We give a gift because gifts are not us living even. Gifts are us being above how people act. And that's who God has called us to be. What would it look like in your life for you and me to return good for evil. Would you take out that paper? Maybe you still have it. Who did you write on that list? What did you write? What names did you write? Here's my question. How did you respond to them? How did you respond to them? Did you respond by going, you know what? You cut me off. I'm cutting you off. How did you respond to your husband or your wife or your kids or, or that person at work? Did you respond with the goodness of God or did you respond with meeting them and making it even? Can we pray right now? Because I believe God is speaking to someone in the room. I believe God's about to do something in your life. But Father, I thank you so much for each person in this room. I thank you for hot chocolate because hot chocolate reminds me of Abigail. And Abigail lived a life where she didn't trade evil with evil, but she gave her goodness and stopped a cycle of destruction and saved a family, God. And I just pray for all the families that are representing and all the people in this room, God, that if this room alone would just trade good with evil, it would change our city. So God, I just pray that we do what you asked us to do. And Lord, we thank you for who you're making our church and who you're making us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.